Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so very much for being here tonight, We're, or today, rather, as this is an afternoon event. We're so excited that you're here with us. I won't take up too much of your time because I understand that nobody wants to hear from me this afternoon, and there's something very exciting coming up. So bear with me for just a moment. A welcome to McNally Robinson Booksellers. We're located here in Treaty One territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. McNally Robinson Booksellers itself rests on the land once occupied by the Métis community of Roostertown. We are gathered here this afternoon for a very exciting event and so pleased that our friends at the Winnipeg International Writers Festival are co-presenting this with us as part of Thin Air 2023. You'll hear more from their director, Charlene Deal, at the end. And we're so thrilled that Candlewood Press, who published this beautiful new book from John Clausen, helped to get him here and make sure this event could happen. I just have two words of instruction for you. The first is that there will be time to ask questions of the author this afternoon. So start thinking about those now and during the presentation. If you do have a question, I'll just put your hand up and I'll run over to you with this microphone and that makes sure that everybody here can actually hear the question and we don't have to worry about repeating it. And at the end of the event, we'll ask you all just to remain in your place for one moment because we have to make sure that John safely makes it to the table just beside our cash desk so that he can sign books for all of you. Now, I won't belabor the point because I know so many of you know who our special guest this afternoon is, but I just wanted to say that you were very, very lucky because in a little while you're going to meet not only Attila, and of course, a certain skull that keeps her company in an odd way on a windswept night in the skull, a Tyrolean folktale. John Clausen is a Caldecott medalist and number one New York Times bestselling author. You know his work and love it for everything from I Want My Hat Back to his collaborations with Mac Barnett, Amy Timberlake, and Sarah Pennypacker. He was born here in Winnipeg and he's back here with us this afternoon. Please give an enormously warm welcome to John Clausen. That's such a nice voice. I feel like this is like a step down. That's such a, that's a radio voice. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's very good to be home. Um, I we're going to do the skull today, but I also uh, when I, when when opportunity allows, and I think it does. Uh, I've been reading the book before this called The Rock in the Sky because it came out during COVID, and I didn't get to read it to anybody except for my cat. So I thought we'd start with that one, if that's okay. It's, it's, and if you have little ones here, maybe they'll be more into that instead, just a sec. What did I do? What did I press? Everyone's watching. There we go. All right. So we're going to do this one first. Also, my picture books, they're just dialogue, and I never really know how to read these out loud. Don't advance without me. Um, so I just kind of shout them. They're not very expressive. I'm sure that if you read this one at home, as a parent or a teacher or a librarian, you do voices and accents and all sorts of things. I don't do any of that. I just yell my books. Um, the skull I've been reading more gently, we'll find out. But um, my own books, when it's just dialogue, I'm just kind of shouting them. So here is our rock. Here is our title page, The Rock from the Sky by me. This book has parts. It has little stories in it. And the first story is called The Rock. And here is our turtle. And he's standing next to this flower. And he says, I like standing in this spot. It is my favorite spot to stand. I don't ever want to stand anywhere else. Apologies for the misspellings of favorites and things like that. Um, Candlewick's American. So there's a giant rock just falling above him somewhere. We don't know how far, we don't know how high, we don't know how fast, but it's coming. This is like a mole armadillo creature. I made him up, um, but he's nocturnal and he's kind of always surprised to find himself in one of these books. Um, but the turtle says, hello. And the mole says, hello, what are you doing? And the turtle says, I'm standing in my favorite spot. Come, stand in it with me. And the mole says, okay. So they're both standing there. What do you think of my spot? Actually, I have a bad feeling about it. A bad feeling, yes. The mole points to a plant on the other side of the landscape there and it says, there is another spot over there. Do you see it? And the turtle says, yes, I see it. And the mole says, I will go and stand in it to see if it feels better than this spot. He's standing over there. It's very far away though, so they have to shout at each other. And he says, how does that spot feel? 
And the mole says, I cannot hear you. You are too far away. I'm going to come back. The rock is still falling. The mole is back. Does this spot still feel bad? Yes, it feels even worse than before. I'm going back to the other spot. Do you want to come with me? No, I will stay here. This is my favorite spot. Are you sure? Yes. He goes over there. They're both standing at their spots. A snake arrives. Um, he has a beret. I kind of feel like there was only two little bowler hats in the, in the box, and he got a beret and wanted a hat too. He doesn't say anything in this book because snakes scare me and snakes talking scares me a lot. So he doesn't say anything. But the mole says stuff to him and he says, oh, hello, I am standing in this spot by myself. Come, stand in it with me. So they're both standing over here and the turtle sees them and he says, my spot is better. And the mole says, you are too far away to hear. I am coming closer. We still cannot hear you. He's all the way over. He says, I said my spot is better. And a giant rock falls on his spot. <laughs> That's the end of that story. The second story is thank you. The second story is called The Fall. It wasn't supposed to be called The Fall. It was supposed to be called The Seven Lies. Um, but my publisher didn't like that. They said, you can't put that title in a kid's story. And I was like, have you met a child? <laughs> But it is, I think we should call it the seven lies today. And I want you to help me count the lies, all right? So here we are, we have the turtle at the top of the rock there. He's climbed up on it since it's fallen. But the first time we meet him, he's upside down. He's on the ground and the mole finds him too. And the turtle says, hello. And the mole says, hello, what happened? And the turtle says, nothing. That's number one. The mole comes closer. He says, were you climbing on it? And the turtle says, no. Did you fall off? No, moving pretty fast. Do you need help? No, I do not need help. Okay, I never need help. Okay. And then the, turtle, uh, the mole sits down and the turtle says, what are you doing? And the mole says, I came to take a nap. It's nice under here. You can take a nap too if you want. There's just enough room for two. No, I'm not tired. Okay. So the mole closes his eyes and the turtle keeps going. I'm never tired. Okay. Seven. Now they're both asleep. That's the end of that story. <laughs> Number three is called the future. So now the uh, turtle finds the mole sitting at the top of the rock and he, he's closing his eyes and he's sort of meditating. And the turtle says, what are you doing? And the mole says, I'd like to close my eyes and imagine into the future. Are you doing it right now? Yes. Come, close your eyes and do it with me. In the future, this spot will look different. New things will grow. New plants and trees will come. A whole forest, maybe. The turtle says, it's nice here. And the mole says, yes, it is. Wait, what is that? Does something live here? And the mole says, maybe, I don't know. Well, things like looking at this flower and weird rings are coming out of its eyes. And the turtle says, what is it? And the mole says, we are in the future. I don't know what it is. And the turtle says, what's it doing? And the mole says, shh, it will hear you. And then a fiery death ray comes out of its eyeball and fries the flower. And the turtle begins to scream. And the mole says, shh. And it walks away and the flower is dead forever and smoldering and the turtle is still screaming. And the mole says, okay, okay, I think it's going. Okay, it's gone. And the turtle says, I don't want to imagine into the future with you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> number four is called the sunset and now it's the mole and the snake again and they're watching the sunset and the mole says i like to sit and watch the sunset my favorite part is at the very end this is a good spot to watch it from there's nothing in the way the turtle shows up he says hello and the mole says hello and the turtle says what are you doing and the mole says we're watching the sunset and the turtle says i did not hear you i am going to come closer he comes closer. Okay, what are you doing? And the mole says, we are watching the sunset. And the turtle says, I still cannot hear you. I am going to come closer again. So he gets all the way over, he says, okay, what are you doing? And the mole says, we're not doing it anymore. <laughs> That's my favorite story I've ever written, I think. <laughs> my, my editor did not like that one. She said that because he's blocking the sun for us, he's not blocking the sun for them. And that made me like it even more. I really like that story. The fifth story is called No More Room. 
So he finds them sleeping under there, the turtle does. And he says, I see, I see how it is. Just enough room for two. Maybe I will go to the other spot by myself. Maybe I will never come back. He turns around and says, I said, maybe I will never come back. And they kind of wake up a little bit, but they still don't quite hear him. Maybe I am too far away for them to hear. I will go back closer and tell them again. I said, maybe I will never come back. And a giant rock falls on the head. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to my other book. That was the end of that book. That was the end. So we're going to read the skull. Oh, yeah, I brought a photo. Look at that. I'm wearing basically the same hat, just the red version today. This was taken probably a few minutes drive from here. Butter tart and everything. Um, but why isn't this working? OK, we're going to do the skull. Um, this book is based on a story that I found, but uh, I found it in a library in Juneau, Alaska. I was doing a presentation, and I uh, before I went on, I, was, I had some time to wander around the library, so I went to the folk tale section, and there was this book called Ghosts and Goblins, but I didn't know that title. I just, I didn't remember it later. Uh, I opened it up, and there was a table of contents, and there's a story called The Skull, and I thought, that's a fantastic title. Let's read that one, and it was four pages long. I read it very quickly, and then I did the thing at the library and went home, and I didn't remember the title of the book. I didn't even remember the story very much, but I remember the basic gist of it, and like for a year, I thought of the basic gist of it. And I finally wrote the librarian in Juneau back from home. And I said, there is a book in your library somewhere. I don't remember the title. I don't remember anything about it. But it has a story inside called The Skull. And in two hours, she had a scan of it in my inbox because librarians are magic people. They should be running the world. Um, but, uh, but I read it again, and I changed a lot of it. And I couldn't figure out how I'd done that. I didn't think I'd changed it. I thought I remembered the story pretty clearly, but I changed tons of it. And I still remembered my weird changed version. And I thought I should make a book out of the changed version. Um, and so we did, and that's this book. So first story, or first page rather. One night in the middle of the night, while everyone else was asleep, Otillo finally ran away. That's a title page and Otillo running away. Part one. This book has parts and it has words underneath the parts to tell you what's about to happen in that part. So these words are the forest, the dark, the house. Otilla ran and ran. She ran through trees and up hills. She ran for a long time, all through the night. Otilla had grown up in this forest, but after a while, the trees began to look different. They were getting closer together. Otilla kept running. As she ran, Otilla began to hear her name being called. She couldn't tell if it was someone's voice or the wind in her ears. I'd like to ask you guys to whisper Otilla's name in a very creepy, whispery, windy way, if you would help me out. Yeah, that's the stuff. Keep going. That's good stuff. If you hear that, even if your name isn't Otilla, you just keep running, kids. Okay, now stop. Otilla suddenly tripped on a fallen branch and fell hard into the snow. She didn't get up. She could not run anymore. She listened for her name, but now it was quiet. Otilla lay in the snow and the dark and the quiet, and she cried. When she was done crying, she got up and began moving forward again. All at once, the trees stopped. She came out of the woods into an open yard. In front of her, in the distance, was a very big, very old house. It's our house. Um, this book is was written as a Tyrolean folktale, and that means it's, it comes from sort of a part of Austria, northern Italy, a, kind of a valley in the Alps. Um, I didn't do much research on the Alps or that part of the world. This is very much set near Niagara Falls, where I grew up, um, on the Ontario escarpment and big, weird houses they have built there that used to scare the pants off me when I was little. Otilla went up to the house. It looked abandoned, but when she tried to open the door, it was locked. She knocked loudly to see if anyone was inside, but nobody came to the door. Hello, she called out. Hello, someone answered. Otilla looked up to where the voice had come from. In a window above the door, she saw a skull looking at her. Part two, the skull, the rooms, the dance. The skull moved himself a little so he could see better. Hello, he said again. 
Hello, said Otello. My name is Otello. I ran away and I need a place to hide and rest. The skull was quiet for a moment. Then he said, I will come down and let you in, but only if you promise to carry me once I do. I am just a skull and rolling around is difficult for me. Otello was quiet for a moment. Then she said, all right. The skull left the window. Otello waited outside the door. She waited for a long time. It was very quiet. Then she heard some small scratching on the other side of the door. The latch turned and the door cracked open against the snow. The skull pushed the door open wider. Thank you, said Otilla. You're welcome, said the skull. Otilla picked him up. She had never picked up a skull before. Come in, said the skull. I will show you the house. All right, said Otilla. They walked into the hall. It's a nice house, said Otilla. Yes, said the skull. I've always liked it here. Have you lived here for a long time, said Otilla? Yes, said the skull. They went into a room. This is the fireplace room, said the skull. I come here to drink tea by the fire in the evenings. You can make tea, said Otilla. No, not anymore, said the skull. Can you make a fire, said Otilla? No, said the skull. They were quiet. Is that you in the picture, said Otilla? It used to be, said the skull. They went into the garden room. Oh, I like this room, said Otilla. This is my favorite room, said the skull. Can you eat the pears, said Otilla? I can eat the ones that fall on the ground, but I can't reach the good ones on the branches, said the skull. I will get one for you, said Otilla. She held a pear for him and he took a bite. The bite of pear went through him and fell onto the floor. Ah, delicious, said the skull, thank you. They went into a room with masks hung on the walls. What are these masks for, said Otilla? I used to collect them, said the skull. Can you wear them, said Otilla? They are just for show, said the skull. You're not supposed to wear them. They're wearing the mask. <laughs> I, I made this book after we had kids. There's just no way they're not wearing those masks. <laughs> they went downstairs. What is this room, said Otilla. This is the dungeon, said the skull. There is nobody in it now. What is this hole, said Otilla. That is a bottomless pit, said the skull. Otilla threw the core of her pear into the hole and listened. It did not make a sound. Do you want to hear the, do you want to see the tower, said the skull? All right, said Otilla. They climbed the steps up the tower. Does anyone else know about this house, said Otilla? No, said the skull, you're the first person to find it in a very long time. Um, I know that house that we saw before didn't look like it had a big round tower on it, but I really wanted to draw a big round tower. There is a big round tower on the Niagara Escarpment called the Brock's Monument, and you can climb it, and you, if you're very little, it's the scariest thing you'll ever do. They got to the top and walked out onto the balcony. You can see everything from here, said the skull. It's beautiful, said Otilla. Careful, said the skull. The wall is not very high, and it's a long way down if you fall. They looked out over the forest. You said you ran away, said the skull. Yes, said Otilla. You don't want them to find you. No, said Otilla, I don't. The skull waited to see if she wanted to say any more, but she didn't. All right, said the skull. And he said, there's a big room I haven't shown you. How big, said Otilla. This is the biggest room I've ever seen, said Otilla. This is the ballroom, said the skull. It was for dancing. There were lots of dances here. I went to a dance once, said Otilla, but it was not in a room like this. I did like the dancing, though. I love dancing, said the skull. Otilla put her mask back on. She carried the skull to the middle of the ballroom, and she held him to face her. Would you care to dance, sir, said Otilla? Milady, said the skull. They danced and danced and danced until it got dark. Part three, the secret, the bedroom, the headless skeleton. When it was dark, Otilla made some tea and a fire in the fireplace room. Would you give me some tea, please, said the skull. Otilla took a teacup and poured the tea through his mouth and onto the chair. Ah, nice and warm, said the skull, thank you. You can spend the night here if you want to, said the skull. I do want to, said Otilla. There is something I should tell you, said the skull. Otilla put her tea down. There is a skeleton that comes here to this house, said the skull. It is a headless skeleton. It walks around the halls looking for me. When it finds me, it chases me. Has it ever caught you, said Otilla? No, said the skull quietly, but I'm not as fast as I used to be. Otilla looked closely at the skull. You don't want it to catch you. No, whispered the skull, I don't. Will it come tonight, said Otilla? The skull looked at the fire. It comes every night, he said. 
Otilla looked at the fire too. All right, she said. She kept looking at the fire and she started to think. When it was time to go to sleep, the skull showed Otilla to a bedroom. It was a nice room. There was a big comfortable bed and some pajamas for her to wear. Otilla liked the pajamas. <laughs> um, I don't draw smiles very often. I just, I'm not good at drawing smiles. I never get it right. And I'm pretty sure she is smiling in this. And I tried a bunch of times, um, but instead I just told her to hold the pajamas up a little higher. <laughs> block that smile. We should try to get some sleep, said the skull. The skeleton will come soon enough. Otilla blew out the light. They slept deeply and peacefully for a long time. The house was dark and very quiet until in the middle of the night, a headless skeleton opened the bedroom door. From somewhere in the skeleton's chest came a voice, but it only shouted one thing. Give me that skull. I want that skull. The skeleton ran into the room. It was faster than Otilla had expected. She had just enough time to grab the skull before it reached him. The skeleton pulled at the skull, trying to get him away from her, but Otilla held on tight. She did not let go. Finally, she got the skull free. She slipped past the skeleton and ran to the door. Give me that skull. I want that skull. Give me that skull. I want that skull. Can we see where she's running on the right hand side there? Up that tower, right? Give me that skull. I want that. Yeah. Uh, I had to do this drawing a few times because on the first drawing, she's holding the skull and outstretched only one hand, and this drawing was originally only one hand push, but that's a risky one hand push. Um, so we have to believe that she had time to put the skull on the wall and then two hand push it. Um, kids, if you ever have to push a man-sized headless skeleton off a wall, you two hand that thing, don't one hand it. They watched the skeleton fall into the dark until they heard it land, the sound of bones hitting the ground. They listened some more, but they did not hear anything after that. All right, said Otilla, time for bed. Otilla carried the skull quietly back down to the bedroom. She put him on the pillow and tucked him under the blanket. Then she put on her coat. Aren't you going to sleep too, said the skull? In a little while, said Otilla, patting the skull gently. I'll be back soon. She blew out the light and closed the bedroom door. Part four, the bones, the fire, the pit. Otilla went to the kitchen and found a bucket, a kettle with tea leaves, a teacup, and a rolling pin. Then she went out, then she went out into the night and climbed down slowly and carefully to where the skeleton had fallen. When she got to the bottom, she found the skeleton's bones scattered everywhere. She gathered them into the bucket. She found every single one. Otilla carried the bucket of bones to a rock. She took, a, she took a bone out of the bucket and put it on the rock. Then she took out the rolling pin and held it over her head and smashed the bone. She smashed it over and over into smaller and smaller pieces until those pieces were as small as they could get. Then she took out another bone and she did it again. She did it to all of them. Then Otilla made a fire. She made it huge and hot. She melted some snow in the kettle with the tea leaves and made tea over the fire. Then she took the bone pieces and threw them into the flames. She poured her tea into the teacup and drank it as she watched the pieces burn to ash. When the fire was over, she gathered the ashes into the bucket and carried it back up the hill, back up to the house. She went to the dungeon and dropped the whole bucket into the bottomless pit. She watched it fall into the dark and listened. It did not make a sound. Then she climbed back upstairs and went to bed. I think the skull was asleep here. <laughs> Part five, breakfast. In the morning, Otilla and the skull had breakfast. Otilla made tea and picked some pears from the branches. I'm sorry last night was so frightening, said the skull. Otilla smiled and patted the skull. It's over now, she said. Thank you for helping me, said the skull. You're welcome, said Otilla. I wonder if the skeleton will ever come back, said the skull. Otilla cut a piece of pear. It won't, she said. The skull looked out the window. It's a nice day outside, he said. Do you want to go for a walk? They went for a walk. It was a nice day outside. Otilla stopped and gave the skull a bite of pear. It went through him and fell onto the sled. Thank you, said the skull. He took another bite. You know, he said, chewing the pear, you could stay here with me if you want. Do you want me to stay, said Otilla? Yes, said the skull, I do. All right, said Otilla. 
And that's the end of the skull. There's an author's note at the end about how I found the story and what we did to it, um, but you can read that on your own time. It won't bother your four-year-olds with that just yet. Um, this book is for Isaac, who is my older son. He's six now. And when I started it, he was four. And he helped me make the pictures because these pictures are more complicated. If you remember the rock from the sky, that's where I'm comfortable. It's just one long horizon line and a bunch of stuff on top of it. But there's some perspective and stuff in this one. And I needed some help with that. And so Isaac and I made little sets and to put pictures of them. And so he would find sticks for the forest. And he, every time he saw a stick for like two years, he was like, put the skull, and he picked it up. And so um, I brought pictures of that that would help me out. We got little Lego men. You can buy cloaks for your Lego men on Etsy for $3, plus shipping and handling. It's very fun. I recommend it. Um, just to get the, you know, I got fancy with this one and shone the lamp through the Lego. Um, I like that one. Um, and it does help, but it was also just really fun making trees and forests with Isaac with this book. Um, and it helped me draw. I wasn't spending all morning figuring out vanishing points after this. My desk is very messy most of the time. Oh, and this is the book from Alaska. This is the one I found. And uh, you can see number six is the skull. And it's just a very short story. This book, this, these two pages, these two pages, which is the only drawing in the story. And I remember seeing this one again. This was the scan that the librarian sent me. And I remember seeing the drawing again. And in my mind, again, the, the story had changed, but that drawing seemed wrong to me. I mean, it's, that is what happens in the story, but um, she seemed so scared in that drawing. And I thought, I don't know about that. Like, here's a little girl who ran away from home in the middle of the night into the woods, found a house, knocked on the door, a skull said, come on in, you got to carry me around. And she was into all of that. <laughs> I don't think that she screams when this happens. I think she looks a little bit more afraid, which she does in our version. But I, I thought, I want to make her a bit more sturdy than that. Um, in this version of the story, the headless skeleton just wrestles her all night in that room with the skull. And then suddenly the sun comes up through the window at dawn, makes the skeleton go poof, gone. And the skull turns into a lady whose head was cut off uh, by the Duke, whose head was the skeleton here. And he got his head cut off for doing that. He was mad about that, so he chases the lady around all the time. It was a big mess. Um, but also, the lady, once she's transformed back, she, all she does is she gives Otella the castle, she gives her a bunch of food and children to play with, and then she leaves too. And I was really sad about that. They were getting along really well. And so, also, you really have to destroy headless skeletons. You really have to, and like they come back, those guys, you really have to make sure they're gone. Um, and so all of that, those were the changes that I made mostly. Also at the beginning of this story, let's see how it begins. Yeah, a little orphan girl was sent to live with a grown up cousin. The cousin didn't like children. She scolded the little girl for every small fault and made her so unhappy that one morning she ran away. Like, I just cut all that. I liked the idea that we could figure out why we would run away. Everybody has a reason. Sometimes it's the dishes, sometimes it's not. But I thought if we take it away, then you get to put your own reason for running away. And so we did. And I like the story much, much better because we don't say why she ran away. Um, but that's the whole story. It's just like three, four pages long. Um, but that, that is the work from the skull. And now we can do some questions and talk about it if you want to. Does anybody have any questions about this book or the last book? Yeah. Oh, you have these books? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> I'm glad you have the books. Are there any other questions? <laughs> what was the inspiration for these books? It changes a lot. The inspiration for The Rock from the Sky was I wanted to draw a big rock. Um, that really is like you can that can be a good start and I also don't like to draw characters doing anything and um, there was a great talk that I heard Alfred Hitchcock give about suspense and shock and he said imagine there's a scene in a movie where there's people sitting around a table having a very con boring conversation about baseball or something and after 10 minutes the bomb under the table blows everybody up 
and you've given your audience one minute of shock. But if you start the scene by showing the audience the bomb and then show them the boring conversation, it'd be very interesting. And I like drawing boring conversations and people just sitting around doing nothing, but I need a bomb under the table to do it. And so I got to draw a big rock and I got to do my boring conversation. That rock let me do it. That's what started that book. This book, the inspiration for it was that there's a couple of things. I liked that we got this headless skeleton. How often do you get to just kill something five times over? Um, a headless skeleton is very good for that, especially if it just repeats the same line over and over again. You feel bad about doing that to almost any other character, but to him, you feel okay about it. Um, I also just like that these two characters are going through something very emotional. Both of them are, but they don't have any expression. The skull can't change his expression, and Otilla is pretty stoic by now. She's been through enough. And so here are these two characters really going through it, but I'm not very good at drawing emotion. I don't like to do it. And we don't have to with these two. And I really like that about it too. So that was, that was the reason for this book. Hello, I bring up a question from one of my grade three students okay. to you. It's about the rock from the sky. Okay. And in the fall or the seven lies, mm -hmm. they wondered if the turtle on the rock was put there by the bear. Oh, I know. Because we have been reading your books all week and they put that all together. In the book, I want my hat back. When he meets the turtle, the turtle says he hasn't seen anything all day. He's been trying to climb this rock. And the bear says, would you like me to lift you on top of it? And the turtle says, yes, please. Um, I wondered how we got up there too, because it's kind of a hard climb. It's a bit of a weird arc. I figured maybe there's another way up on the side we can't see. Um, but that crossed my mind. Turtles belong on top of rocks as far as our universe is concerned. So if they want, if they need to, if they want to connect the lore that way, I'm good with that. That's good. Yeah. Have you ever worried during your writing that maybe you go a little bit too dark? Uh -huh. Have you ever had to back up? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I do. I have, I, I, I like to think I have pretty good access to my own second grade self and what a wimp I was about everything, but not books. For some reason, I wouldn't watch scary movies or scary TV. I still have a very weak stomach for most of it. But I was so brave about scary books. I love this. I would seek them out because there's they're a safer medium somehow. You're in control. You're holding it. You're above it. You can close it. You can turn the page when you want. I think that kids get braver about scary books than they do about anything else. Um, I have written stories that I was like, nope, can't do that one. There was one called "I Am a Hat" that I tried to write instead of "We Found a Hat," and it was about a hat being kidnapped and it by thieves, but it was his monologue about being kidnapped. And that got way too dark. <laughs> I was like, no, we can't make this one. So I, it is good when you feel yourself crossing the line because you're like, oh, the line still exists. And I think for this one, the goal was to take care of them really hard. I think that, that like, you can take them places if you take care of them. If you make them feel safe inside the thing, and that has any number of ways of doing it, you can take them to places. I'm not interested in jumping out and scaring them or like messing with them. You have to do it gently. And then you can do it, but it's that's the trick of it, and you, and it's a balancing act, and you're not quite sure ever because I don't like to road test the books before they're done, and so reading them to kindergartners in New Jersey for the first time is like when you figure that out. Um, but they often have darker ideas than I do. Even I remember at the end of this one, we read it to kindergartners in New Jersey, and I was like, "You sure?" And they're like, "Yeah, we want you to do it." And a four-year-old came up to me later and she says, "I know why the skull doesn't want his skeleton back," and I'm not even sure that's his skeleton. But she thought it was, and she was like, I know why. I said, why? She goes, because sometimes your head does, or your body does things your head doesn't want it to do. And then she turned around and went back into the classroom. And I was like, they're ahead of me. Like, that's, that's a four-year-old, best of luck. And so they're, they're always their game, I think. And they know about skulls and skeletons already. They just want to talk about them. So, but it, it is a conscious thing. You do think about it, yeah. The, the rabbit, the fate of that rabbit. <laughs> The fate of the rabbit. The fate of the rabbit. That was uh -huh. the first thing I ever read by you. Uh -huh. This has more teeth than I thought it might. It certainly does. Yeah, the fate of the rabbit. Um, we just take a vote on the fate of the rabbit. I don't like to say it outright. If they don't know yet, then I don't want to be the one to tell them. Um, and so for those two first two books, especially, it's like, what do you guys think? Raise your hand. And then again, they fill it in as much as they want to or are able to then. And that's kind of the trick of those books is that like, I'm not going to take you places you're not ready to go. You're going to take yourself when you're done. So. As long as it's their fault, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. <laughs> we were just wondering why so many of your books are about hats. Yeah. Um, I don't know how that happened. I think the first one, I Want My Hat Back, was I had done a series of greeting cards with animals on them, and they had party hats on. 
And I didn't know how to draw characters before that of my own. I hate drawing characters. And they always felt very happy to be in my books. And, um, but I hadn't been able to figure out any that I liked. And I had a friend who did greeting cards and she said, would you draw me some greeting cards? And at the time I was a set designer. I didn't like drawing chairs and rocks and things like that. And so I said, yeah, I'll give you some happy birthday with chairs and rocks on it. And she's like, that's no, you have to draw me some animals. And so I drew animals that didn't look like they wanted to be there. They were wearing party hats, just staring at you. Like, is this what we're supposed to, is this a birthday card for you? And I thought, that's how I want to do it. That's how I want to draw these characters, these characters that don't want to be there, don't understand what birthdays are because they're animals. And so I had the title, I want my hat back, but I thought it was about a little boy not wearing a hat on the cover. But then as soon as I did the greeting card, I thought, oh, we should do animals because they don't wear hats anyway. That's really funny. And then the second book after that first book, I didn't make it about hats. It was called 10 Bad Fish. And it was about a gang of fish that rode around terrorizing everybody. And then they terrorized and especially big fish. And then it was seven bad fish, five bad fish, that whole thing. But it was a book about a bunch of jerks. And I didn't like it. And, it was, and the ending of it was one little fish wearing a hat just because he's a cowboy, I guess. And the big fish is behind him, but the rhythm of the story would have him eaten after the end of the book. And the editor said, like, I don't like this. And I was like, I don't like it either. And she goes, what's your favorite part? And I said, the end, where it's just one fish and one big fish behind them. And so accidentally, it turned into another hat book. And then the, the third book, that was on purpose. I was like, oh, I have to make a third hat book. But it was kind of an accidental, organic sort of thing. But hats are good because they don't, you don't need a hat. It's, a, it's an emotional thing. If the bear was like, someone stole my money or my food, you're like, well, maybe he was poorer or he was hungrier. But a hat, that's just an emotional, you're just mad because like that was my hat. And you get much more angry about that. So they're very useful that way. They're not necessary. Yeah, and then it's nice to put them on top of characters for really little kids. They're like, I wanna see a hat on that bear. And that's the end of the book. Um, for the bottom, does Pith, did you use a Sharpie? Oh, good question. Let's go look at the bottomless pit. So this book, all the art in this book was done, but we can go look at the bottomless pit to talk about it. Where was it? It was further on. Here we are. I think I used ink. I think I used markers, maybe even Crayola markers for that. And then inside the Crayola, like in the ink, there's some, you know when you sharpen a pencil and it has like little black stuff that comes out of the pencil, a little powder? You can mix that with water and draw with it with a brush. And so all the black little speckly bits in the, in the in these pictures are that. They're like little pencil shavings with water. And so it's a mixture of pencil and marker and then those pencil shavings, that's what they are. Even the coat, the coat is pencil most of the time. Everything about Otilla is usually pencil, colored very dark. It's hard to see because this projector and if you look at the pages, but she's usually done with pencil. I like, how, I like just using things that you guys have in your desks. I don't like fancy, fancy stuff. I like pencils and markers and stuff. Uh, in, in the Fallen Rock, is the turtle the same one in uh, I Want My Hat Back? I think so. He looks a little different, but probably he's just gained some weight. Between the two <laughs> My daughter wants to ask how you draw so well. <laughs> I draw by, by giving myself things I know I can draw. That's the trick. You don't put yourself in places you can't draw. And so I can't draw Otilla crying, so she's not crying. You don't draw what you don't want to draw. Why doesn't the skull have a mouth? That's a good question, too. Why doesn't the skull have a mouth? Because we talk about his mouth, right? He opens it to drink tea and eat pears and stuff. What I realized, because I tried him with a mouth, I tried him with teeth even, and he always looked like he was smiling. Even if it was a straight line, he looked like he was smiling. And I don't think the skull smiles throughout this book. So I just didn't give him a mouth. Otilla has a mouth, I'm not sure why, I can't remember. But um, I don't put mouths on almost any of my books. Have you seen a book called Sam and Dave Dig a Hole? There's two boys without mouths. They never have them, even though they drink chocolate milk and eat animal cookies. I just, for some reason, mouths drive me crazy. And I feel like you, if you have a mouth on a page where someone's talking, it looks like it should be open. And I'm like, well, if it's, yeah, just like that. Wouldn't that be funny? A whole book just like, ah. So I close their mouths and erase them so you don't even think about them. But I understand there's an inconsistency here because we actually talk about his mouth a lot. Have you ever tried using a different art? <laughs> you know, every book I think I try a different art style. 
And then it comes out and I'm just like, oh, I did it. I did the same thing again. <laughs> I think I use color. I think I use so much color. And then I don't. It comes out and I see it on the shelf in the bookstore and I think, oh man, I didn't use any color at all. I think after a little while, you sort of, you have your thing. And as much as you try and do something else, you kind of just, you know how shopping carts, when they're broken, they only go like one direction. That's kind of how I am with colors and style. I just sort of, I try and push it that way. And it just goes this way. I think last time you're here, you teased us about maybe doing a book just about snow. Is that still a possibility? Oh, that was a long time ago. That book was the, another version of the third hat book. And it was called We Found a Hat Too. And it was about two like weird penguin guys who find a hat in the snow and have a wait, like they waited out. They don't, either of them want to leave because the other one's going to get the hat, but it's snowing. And so the snow comes up and up and up and they're still like this. And they're like, I'm not leaving. Are you leaving? Well, maybe I'll leave. And, they, they, and then it's just a white page and you wonder whether they left, but you're pretty sure they did not. And I tried it and that was another one. He's left, but like went too far. The book killed the characters. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't an overreaction. It was me murdering two penguins. <laughs> and I was like, no, don't like it. Went too far. So that was the snow one. So I haven't, I haven't solved that yet. Closest we've come to a snow book is this one. Your color palette is yes. super unique. What inspires your color palette? Fear of color. <laughs> um, I went to school for animation and I, it was just drawing, just pencils all for three, four years. And so when I got into book illustration kind of by accident, I don't understand color and mixing color. I, I like value. I like playing with value and popping her eyes out so you can see them and things. And my theory and hope is that that grabs kids as much as color does, where there's a theory that bright colors attract kids and their attention and hold it. I think you can do the same thing with contrast and they don't miss the color. That's my hope because I don't know how to mix color. I'm very scared of it. So you can use it like this, where it's just like, if there's one idea for color, then I can use it. But I'm not getting into mid-tones and cools and lights and all that stuff. Yeah, it's bits fear that guides the palette. <laughs> My favorite illustrators was always sort of into light. And you used to sell sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever do that? I would if these illustrations existed anywhere, but they don't. Um, they're pieces. I, I How I would do, especially these early ones, um, is that I would probably draw four or five pages of trees. And then I would circle my favorite ones and bring them in digitally. They're all done on paper. All the pieces are done on paper but they're assembled digitally. And so these don't exist anywhere. And that's never bothered me. They're supposed to be books. That's what I care about. Um, I don't get romantic about that, but that means I never have originals. Yeah. Is color digital? Color's all digital. Yeah. You, I'm, all these pieces were black and white when I did them probably, but the house may have even been just like a purple marker. I don't know, um, but it doesn't matter. You bring it in digitally, you can adjust it there. I just need the noise. You just want the texture, whatever gives you that, as long as you can control it later. Um, I just like making all this stuff on paper first and then assembling it later. But it means that, yeah, physically nothing, only the book, that's what matters, yeah. Oh. Why did you keep the name Utila? I like the name Otilla. It's kind of a weird one to say, right? And I've heard some people roll the L's into Otilla. I don't know. Um, but, there, but there are a few different versions of this story that end differently and start differently, but all of them she's called Otilla. So I figured I'd keep that because I couldn't think of a better one. And it sounds like a good strong name of like someone who would really destroy a skeleton, right? I thought it fit. And we have time for two more questions before we get to Charlene. If we have more questions after, you can ask it during the signing if you come up to. It says it was finished digitally. Mm -hmm. What did you use to finish it digitally? My computer. Um, what you do when you do the drawings is that there's pages and pages of trees and things like that right here. And you scan them in and you bring them into, I use Photoshop. People use a bunch of different programs, but I'm an old man and I use Photoshop. And um, and you, it's just a coloring program, but you put it all together like a puzzle. You can cut out your drawings and put them all together in these pieces. And then you can use, it was black and white, and so you can just click fill it. This is just a solid color of that teal. And then the orange was probably marker that I overlaid onto that. But you just use the computer with a big screen that I can draw on, and you just adjust it, and you draw on your computer screen. 
And that's how it was finished digitally. What was that? Halloween. Do I like Halloween? I like Halloween. Do you like Halloween? Oh, she, yes, she does. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming, everybody. This was very nice. I was very glad to read the book here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Was that fabulous or what? <laughs> Will you please also take a second to uh, offer your thanks to our hosts here at McNally Robinson? This is an amazing place to get. It's the only bookstore in all of the world that has like a spiral staircase that goes up into Magic Land where the kids' books are. Amazing. My name is Charlene Deal, and I'm the director of the Writers' Festival, and we are really happy to be co-presenting along with uh, McNally Robinson. A big thanks to Candlewood Press for making this spectacular book. Uh, and I just for those of you who are grown-ups in the crowd, we do still have a couple of events here during the festival. Our festival ends on Wednesday. We uh, are hosting Emma Donahue here on Monday and Michael Crummy on Tuesday. Big week. And then on Wednesday, we're gathering over at Kilter Brewing for the annual haiku death match. Not necessarily for kids, but uh, very fun for adults. Plus, it's great uh, uh, brew over there. Uh, and a little bit later here, we'll be uh, teaming up again for to host Wokishi Rice. So grab a little program if you can. Uh, we also have a, a QR code toward the back. So if you um, want to shoot your phone in and on the way out and say how spectacular this event would we'd be happy to hear that news. And then I've got one more message, which is remember you have to stay seated while uh, John gets safely to the uh, signing desk, which is over by the cash desk. There's books there, uh, he'll sign for you. Uh, you can get the book signed and then uh, pay for it, or you can buy the book at the cash desk and then take it over and get in the signing line. But the trick is you got to pay for the book before you leave the store. So kids, that might not pertain to you, but it will definitely pertain to your parents. 